committee will come to order. Good afternoon. One of the top priorities of this committee is to wage the battle against criminals who are constantly trying to swindle American seniors out of their hard-earned savings. These scammers are endlessly inventive. Last year alone, our committee's fraud hotline received 1,100 calls on more than 30 different scams from victims located in every state. At the top of the list was the IRS impersonation scam, followed by the Jamaican lottery, deceptive robocalls, computer tech support fraud, identity theft, grandparent scams, the list goes on and on. Regrettably, today we add to that list a new scam brought to our attention by federal law enforcement officials and one of my constituents. And this one is particularly pernicious. As we will learn from our witnesses, international criminal cartels have begun to use unsuspecting American seniors as mules to smuggle narcotics across international borders. Tragically, at least 145 victims have been arrested by foreign governments as a result of this scam, and approximately 30 of them remain incarcerated overseas. Typically, the criminal organizations behind this intricate scheme draw seniors into a web of deceit using what I call a predicate scam, like the romance scam in which a con artist develops a personal relationship, usually online, with an unsuspecting senior. Once the seniors are ensnared, the criminals then deceive them into smuggling drugs by asking them to travel overseas where they are given packages with unknown contents to carry across international borders. The scammers give reasons that appear plausible to many seniors. Typically, the criminals pick up the tab for the seniors' travel expenses. That's one way that they convince them that they are legitimate. The criminals also make the international travel arrangements for their victims, which is another key to how this scam works. Instead of sending the senior on a direct flight from the United States to his or her destination, the criminals create a complicated itinerary that requires the senior to stop somewhere overseas, often for days at a time. During this waylay, the seniors are told that it is important that they carry a package or an extra suitcase with them on the next leg of their journey. Unbeknownst to the senior, that package or suitcase he or she has been asked to carry has drugs carefully hidden inside. Even if the senior were to look inside, he or she is unlikely to notice anything unusual. Then, as the seniors try to clear customs overseas, disaster strikes. Officers uncover the contraband and arrest them on charges of drug trafficking. Instead of reaching their destination and finally getting to greet the lover that they met online or recover the funds promised them by Nigerian bankers, they find themselves imprisoned in a foreign jail and thousands of miles away from home. The criminals who set this chain of events in motion are cruel, but also very, very clever. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that seniors and their families become aware of their techniques and take actions to protect themselves and their loved ones from these heartless criminals. We also need a vigorous and determined effort 
by law enforcement, particularly at the federal level, not an easy task given the challenges posed by international boundaries. I look forward to learning more about this terrible new fraud from our witnesses and what can be done to combat it. Thank you. Senator McCaskill. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Collins. This committee has done tremendous work under your leadership to aggressively fight fraud and scams. Later this week, the committee will be publishing its fraud book, reporting the top scams reported to our fraud hotline. I hope that the fraud book can serve as a resource for seniors on scams to watch out for and organizations to contact should they be concerned that they are being scammed. The scams discussed in the fraud book and the scams we have focused on in several committee hearings are really as old as time. Most of these scams are, at their core, confidence scams. What's changed is the use of technology, international boundaries, and even changed tactics in response to our own consumer education. Criminals today have a much easier time covering their tracks and changing their strategies, and the evolving nature of these scams highlights how adaptable they are. The drug trafficking scam has more serious consequences than just a loss of resources, especially in countries where intent is not required to be convicted of a crime. Obviously, for a senior to be placed in prison and deprived of his liberty is an ultimate consequence to an old-fashioned confidence scam. Staying ahead of the curve is very challenging. Take, for example, the IRS impersonation scam, the subject of a committee hearing last year, and still a real problem to seniors nationwide. These calls are being received at increasing rates due to a fraudster's ability to use robocall technology. Even though their success rate per call has decreased, the fraudsters are still reaching many more people. And because many of these calls are coming from overseas and using VoIP, voice over internet protocol, they are very difficult to trace. Now the scammers are twisting the tips provided by the government, acknowledging these red flags in their conversations and using them to pr prove their legitimacy. For instance, tips publicized stated the IRS would never contact you first by phone and there would always be an initial contact via mail. To gain the confidence of our seniors who are aware of this tip, scammers have now changed their script to convince victims that they have been sending them letters regarding their amount owed, but there was no response. Therefore, they are taking immediate action to collect those funds. The IRS impersonation scheme shows just how far fraudsters will go to gain the confidence of our nation's seniors just to get a piece of their hard-earned retirement funds. I'm really pleased that the Department of Justice has joined us today. I don't want to discount the role that consumer education plays in making seniors aware of the latest evolutions of these scams. But that by itself is just simply not enough. Many seniors who fall victim to these scams have diminished mental capacity and are not able to distinguish a real offer from a scam. This drug mule scam, for instance, could appear real to some seniors, especially when they board a plane and fly overseas without having to pay for it. The plane ticket adds an air of legitimacy to what would otherwise be a very shady operation. The only way we will ever really put a dent into this problem is by putting some of these criminals behind bars. I'm curious to hear from DOJ about how they're going about prosecuting these fraud cases, especially in cases that cross international borders. I, I would say as an aside that I used to tease my friends that were in the U.S. Attorney's Office when I was a state prosecutor, saying, I wish you guys would just take 911 calls for a month because the federal government has this wonderful luxury that you get to decide what cases to take. And whatever you don't take rolls downhill to the state prosecutor. We always teased that they could find federal jurisdiction when they wanted to, <laughs> but they never had to. <laughs> this is a case where a local prosecutor cannot go after these criminals. They are international, and that, I would submit for the record, is why we have federal law enforcement, not to prosecute violent crime, not even to prosecute bank robberies, 
not to prosecute kidnapping, but to prosecute those crimes that state and local prosecutors simply cannot reach. And these crimes, these frauds, done from an international location, fall squarely in the lap of federal law enforcement. And I, for one, am impatient with the excuse, well, there's just not, they're just not big enough. I think these are affecting the quality of life for millions of seniors in this country. And I believe it should be a much higher priority of the Department of Justice. We've spent a lot of time working on the Jamaican lottery scam here. And now we have a good working relationship with Jamaican government, but yet we still only extradited one person on the Jamaican lottery scam. Meanwhile, they're making rap songs about the Jamaican lottery quote unquote heroes in Jamaica. They become local people of fame and fortune. I appreciate all the work law enforcement is doing, and I understand that interjurisdictional task forces have been put together, but the time to start taking action is now. Thousands and thousands of people are being ripped off, and the idea that we are not catching many of the crooks has just emboldened criminals and copycats to target more and more seniors. I look forward to working with law enforcement to remove any obstacles that might be in their path towards prosecution. If there's anything that the United States Senate needs to do to make this easier for federal law enforcement authorities, today is the day to let us know what that is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we turn to our panel of witnesses. First, we will hear from Andrew Martin, who is from Henderson, Nevada, but formerly from the great state of Maine. Mr. Martin's father of Dresden, Maine, is a victim of the scam that our committee is focusing on today. After Mr. Martin's testimony, we will view a video of Daniel Seibert, an Arizona resident, and I would like to, at this point, yield to my colleague from Arizona, Senator Flake, whose staff has been extremely helpful in producing the video of his constituents' testimony. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Collins. I, I just want to thank you and the committee and uh, Ranking Member McCaskill for holding this hearing. It represents an important step in putting this new, very troublesome scam under a microscope. As I understand it, uh, this is implicating individuals across the country, including, as the chairman noted, uh, the, uh, the man from Arizona, Daniel Seibert, who we'll hear from in just a minute. Uh, my office was able to work with the committee and to make sure that his testimony was heard today. Um, I want to also thank ICE for intercepting Mr. Seibert uh, before his situation uh, escalated. And I hope that the spotlight that's being put by the committee on this subject will help in stopping others from being victimized in the future. And thank you, and I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you. We will then hear from Scott Brown. Mr. Brown is the acting assistant director of investigative programs at the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, better known as ICE. As uh, Senator Flake mentioned, he prevented um, his constituent from being truly further damaged by this, this scam. Finally, we will hear from Jill Steinberg, a senior counsel in the Office of the Deputy Attorney General at the Department of Justice. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to begin with Mr. Martin. Chairman Collins, Ranking Member McCaskill, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to testify about my father's unwitting involvement in a romance scam which targets seniors to smuggle drugs. My father was arrested in Madrid last July, having nearly two kilograms of cocaine in his possession worth approximately $400,000. He had no idea that he was carrying drugs. He went to Peru thinking he was taking real estate documents to a woman in London whom he met and fell in love with online. The idea that my dad is now a convicted drug smuggler, sentenced last month to six years in prison, is surreal. My dad, a retired pastor, had no prior criminal history of any kind, not even a speeding ticket. Never drank, never smoked, never swore in his entire life. However, he did have his shortcomings. He was too trusting of people and overly gullible. Seven years ago, at age 70, 
My dad found himself single and lonely, so he moved in with my sister. Dad would go on internet chat sites to pass the time. <clears throat> One day, dad meets Joy, an attractive woman in her 30s who claimed to be from Nigeria, but living in the UK. Joy and dad exchanged life stories and photos, and they would spend hours chatting nearly every night. Dad quickly became infatuated with her. The true identity of Joy remains a mystery, but suffice to say, Joy and her associates destroyed my father's life. As a struggling artist, Joy claimed to be poor and hungry. Even though Dad's only income was a mere $1,000 per month that he got from Social Security, he would often forego paying my sister rent so that he could instead support Joy, which he did for six years. Joy gave him lots of attention, told him she loved him, and wanted to marry him one day. Joy told my dad that she inherited a large estate in South America from her wealthy father who was murdered in Africa. The property was worth millions and she wanted to sell it, but the deed was in Peru. She was unable to get a visa to go herself, but if he would go and bring these real estate documents to her, they could have a very comfortable life together. Dad promised he would go for her if he, she could find a way to pay for his trip. Joy allegedly not having any money either at the time put the trip on hold. Last year, my father met and married a local woman. He tells Joy that he needs to end their relationship. Joy reminds Dad of his promise to help her with the real estate papers. She offers to pay Dad a significant amount of money if he would go to Peru and bring papers to her in London. Broken, wanting to recover the money he had sent Joy over the years, Dad decides to keep his promise. Joy tells Dad her family attorney would meet, them, meet him with the papers at the airport in Lima. Dad was to rest up a night or two at the hotel and then fly to London, deliver the documents, get paid, and return home. Against his new wife's advice, Dad boards the plane to Peru. When Dad arrives in Lima, nobody is there to meet him. He calls Joy, learns the attorney was delayed, and is told to wait at the hotel for him. After a few days, Dad has no more money for the hotel and has not yet heard from the attorney. So Joy wires him some money via Western Union, informs him that the lawyer would be there soon, and requests him to continue waiting. After 10 days, a man finally shows up with two sealed packages that felt like books. He gives the books to Dad and a plane ticket to London. The man informs Dad the books were sealed for protection, but if security wants to inspect them, it's okay to go ahead and allow them. This apparently satisfies my father, and so he never looks at the contents. The following day, Dad places the package in his carry-on bag and boards the plane to London. Uh, he has two stops to make, one in Madrid, and then on to Dublin, where he was to spend two days before continuing on to London. When he, upon arriving in Spain, airline staff meets my dad in, with a wheelchair to take him to his connecting gate. He is stopped by security who see the books during extra exam of his carry-on. To my dad's horror, they find cocaine. It takes a couple of weeks for me to learn that dad has been arrested. A few weeks after that, dad's new wife tells him that she wants a divorce. She'd been getting frightening calls from men looking for my father and was forced to change her phone number. My wife Lisa and I flew to Spain last October to visit my father in prison. Dad was overwhelmed when he saw us and broke down in tears. He kept telling us how ashamed he was and how stupid he felt having fallen for this scam. He honestly thought Joy was his friend and he trusted her. Joy was never pushy about the trip to Peru until my dad announced that he was married. I guess at this point the scammers felt that this was their last chance to use my father. Now at age 77, dad may very well spend the rest of his life in prison. He is in very poor health. He has prostate and heart and back problems. He's supposed to have surgery on his back two weeks after the trip, which of course hasn't happened, leaving him in constant pain. He faints all the time and is being kept in the prison infirmary. When Lisa and I saw him, he looked frail and his mental capacity was in obvious decline. He seemed confused about different aspects of his ordeal. He just wants to come home and not die in prison. I will close with the last paragraph from the first letter my dad wrote us in prison. Dad writes, I want to thank you both for not abandoning me here. What to do once you're released if I don't die here? I have no idea as I am now homeless again. How I miss my wife. I feel so terrible for all the pain I caused the woman I loved. I only wanted to provide her more than Social Security allowed, but never anything illegal. I trust you believe me. Love, Dad. Thank you again for the opportunity to share my father's story with you. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. I want to tell you how much it means to the committee that you are willing to publicly share your father's story because I believe it will really help others who have been targeted by these horrendously unscrupulous criminals. I guess all criminals are unscrupulous, but this is so heartless. And the idea that your father is in prison is just extraordinary to me. We're, we look forward to questioning you and learning more. 
we're now going to turn to uh, Senator Jeff Flake's constituent, and his name is Daniel Seibert, and he will tell his story. My name is Daniel W. Seibert. I live in Green Valley, Arizona. I'm 79. It was 19, I don't know, 2006, and that, but that's about when I, I guess you'll say I retired. Mr. Siebert, we learned from ICE that you recently took a trip that ended with Agent Small stopping you in the airport in Georgia. Could you tell us what led to you going on this trip in the first place? It was a fun that I was, I was supposed to have, and I didn't know anything about what they wanted me to do until actually I talked to the, the agents there. What, what, what it turned out to be is, according to what they told me, is I was supposed to go to UK, pick up some kind of a package, from there go to Dubai, and then from Dubai I was supposed to go to Japan. But I didn't think anything about it. I said, well, I've never been to Dubai, so I wanted to go. It's one, I've been in 76 countries, and Dubai is not one of them. So I said, well, I want to go. Well, then they stopped me, and then they explained what was going on. I mean, they treated me very good, respectfully. I mean, they, they knew I didn't know what was going on. So, How were you first contacted by this person who asked you to take the trip? It was by email, but it's it's been so long ago now, I, I don't have any of them emails left. I don't remember his name even. What did he say in the email that led to you going on the trip? The only thing that I can remember and why I wanted to go is because I wanted to go to Dubai. And I just wanted to get to take a vacation. Did he mention that you could get some unclaimed funds that you believe were owed to you? Yes. Actually, the trip didn't cost me a penny. Because if I had to pay, I wouldn't have went. The person that actually paid for the ticket, I don't even know his name anymore, to be honest with you. Once you agreed to go on the trip, did at any point the person tell you you would have to pick up a package? We called me on the phone, and what it was, and said I had, I had to go to the UK to pick up a package which I was going to take with me all the way to Japan. And I asked him about well, what's in the package. He said, thing like it's a thank you package I'm supposed to give to some banker in Japan. In Japan, it's very customary you give people presents. Even if, the, if you go to a bank and the banker treats you nice or whatever, you give the guy or the woman a, a present. And I assume, well, that's what it is. It's, it's a, the head guy at a bank, and you're thanking him ahead of time. So it was just a thank you present. You had no reason to be suspicious about what was in the package? No, none at all, really. I just assumed it was going to be a thank you present, which could have been anything from a wristwatch to a whatever. I mean, it, things like uh, watches and things like that are a common gift in Japan. When the agent stopped you in the airport, did you know why he was stopping you? I had no idea at all. The whole time you thought that you were going to go on this trip to be able to collect your funds, and that's why you went on this trip? Yes, that's right. On another topic, you had said you had been contacted by other people about funds and banks? Yes. Mainly the Nigerian banks and the Federal Reserve Banks here in the United States, and senators now all of a sudden. So you received emails from people impersonating senators, but also from people impersonating other officials and heads of state? Yes, it's from Internal Revenue Service. And there's other people, uh, United States Postal Service was the next one I had. And this one is from Federal Reserve Bank, the one in New Jersey. And I'm not sure about whether they're real or whether they're fake. Because the first thing he wants, he wants $1,750, the guy in New Jersey. Have you sent money to any of those people who have contacted you? <laughs> Regretfully, the answer is yes. Do you remember how much money you have sent to them? Over the last six years, I've probably sent about 150000 Was that before or after you went on the trip? Mm. I think I have sent them some cents, not much, just a couple hundred dollars. I sent most of the money probably five and six years ago. 
but you still do get a lot of emails asking you to send money to them. I get about 400 emails a day. I would guess that 300 of them want money. Thank you. Senator Flake, I want to thank you again. Your staffer did a great job interviewing Mr. Seibert, and you can see what a horrible situation this is. And But for ICE's intervention, he would have ended up smuggling drugs. I have no doubt about that, uh, given that he'd given away $150,000 to scammers over the past six years. So with that, let me turn to Mr. Brown, who can give us a bigger picture of this scam, but also any comments you can make on this particular case and others would be helpful to us. And I want to publicly thank ICE for coming to us and letting us know about this scam so that we could publicize it and um, help prevent others from falling victim. Chairman Collins, Ranking Member McCaskill, and distinguished members, on behalf of Secretary Johnson and Director Saldana, thank you for the opportunity to discuss ICE's efforts to investigate and thwart criminals who target the elderly with nefarious schemes that rob them of their dignity, their money, and potentially their liberty. Homeland Security Investigations, or HSI, is the investigative arm of ICE and conducts criminal investigations to protect the United States against terrorism and other criminal activity that threaten public safety and national security and to bring to justice those seeking to exploit our customs and immigration laws worldwide. In its investigative capacity, HSI enforces more than 400 federal laws and regulations with jurisdiction over investigations of crimes with a nexus to the U.S. border. As you know, there are many fraud schemes, such as phony investment pitches and business opportunities. Such scams are growing increasingly sophisticated and international in scope, and are able to victimize U.S. citizens throughout the country. Perpetrators victimize consumers of all ages, backgrounds, and income levels, but as you've seen, the elderly seem to be disproportionately targeted. Today, I want to bring to the attention of the committee and the general public an emerging trend involving the movement of illicit contraband, drugs, by unsuspecting elderly citizens. Transnational criminal organizations, or TCOs, have long sought to recruit drug couriers who appear to be unsuspicious and present the best opportunity to successfully smuggle contraband across international borders. Using various avenues available on the internet to gather information on potential victims, such as social media, cyber bagging, and phishing emails, TCOs now tailor their inheritance, romance, and business opportunity scams to recruit the elderly to smuggle narcotics through commercial air travel. The unwitting couriers travel to numerous countries with airline tickets provided or funded by the TCOs, and these TCOs often change the itinerary at each leg of the journey in an effort to evade detection. These elaborate international schemes involve these couriers meeting with alleged business partners in numerous countries during a single trip. These business partners have the courier take a suitcase or a gift that appears innocent but contains drugs to the business partner they will meet at their next stop. The average age of the couriers identified and encountered smuggling narcotics was approximately 59, and the oldest of these couriers was 87. The oldest unwitting individual HSI encountered during one of our investigations was 97 years old. HSI special agents were successful in convincing him to abandon his travel plans before he could become another victim. Through our joint targeting and investigative efforts, dubbed Operation Cocoon, HSI and U.S. Customs and Border Protection, working with our foreign counterparts to date, have led to the arrest of 15 facilitators affiliated with the transnational criminal organizations behind these schemes and the interdiction of a total of 272 kilograms of methamphetamine, 209 kilograms of cocaine, four kilograms of ecstasy, and 11 kilograms of heroin. As evidenced by the video testimony you just saw, whenever possible, HSI has worked to prevent potential elderly victims from departing the United States if we believe they may be unwittingly utilized to smuggle narcotics, as we did with Mr. Siebert. 
Unfortunately, there are instances when the recruited individuals are so engaged by the underlying scam used by the criminal organization, they do not believe they are being duped. Often these organizations warn their victims to not believe anyone who approaches them as law enforcement. HSI has warned elderly couriers concerning their potential role in this type of scheme, only to have the elderly victim continue with their travel and subsequently get intercepted in other countries with narcotics. This is why it is so important to raise the public's awareness of these types of fraud schemes. We need to be discussing these schemes with our loved ones, both young and old, and reiterating the adage, if it appears too good to be true, then it probably is. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. I just look, look forward to working with the committee to raise awareness and to eliminate the opportunities for these criminals to prey upon our senior citizens. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. But for your agents intercepting Mr. Seibert, I have no doubt that his fate would have been similar to Mr. Martin's, and I appreciate your good work. Ms. Steinberg. Chairman Collins, Ranking Member McCaskill, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Department of Justice's efforts aimed at combating fraud against our nation's seniors. There are numerous schemes to exploit the elderly for financial gain. With clever perpetrators and the advent of new technologies, many of these scams continue to evolve and challenge law enforcement. That said, across the department, we are engaged on this issue and working hard to seek justice on behalf of elder victims. We take an all-of-department approach to combat elder abuse and financial exploitation. That includes the investigation and prosecution of cases, outreach and education programs, funding relevant research, and providing services to victims. Starting first with enforcement efforts, as the committee knows, many frauds targeting the elderly originate overseas. Combating such schemes requires close collaboration with our international partners. To this end, we are committed to expanding our engagement with law enforcement agencies in countries in which these frauds may originate. As a key component of these efforts, the department co-chairs the International Mass Marketing Fraud Working Group. This group includes other U.S. investigative and regulatory agencies and representatives from Australia, Belgium, Canada, the Netherlands, Nigeria, Norway, Spain, and the United Kingdom. The members of the group meet to improve intelligence sharing, disrupt mass marketing schemes, and increase the effectiveness of criminal and criminal and civil enforcement actions. Project JOLT reflects these successful partnerships. United States and Jamaican law enforcement have worked together to combat fraudulent lottery schemes preying on elderly citizens in this country. In 2015, the department successfully extradited the first Jamaican citizen to be prosecuted in this country in connection with such a lottery scheme. He was convicted and sentenced to 46 months in prison. Since 2009, DOJ has prosecuted nearly 100 defendants linked to these schemes. The defendants who have been sentenced have been sentenced collectively to more than 125 years in prison. In addition to the Jamaican lottery fraud, another common telemarketing scheme involves the reported resale of timeshare interests. In one such case, the de department charged Peter Massimino in connection with a multiple victim timeshare resale scam operating from Florida that led to the victimization of over 25,000 people and a total loss of $35 million. He was sentenced to 87 months in prison. Just recently, the department concluded its prosecution of Gilbert Freeman, also for a timeshare resale scheme, in which the majority of victims were elderly. Freeman defrauded more than 1,400 owners out of about $5 million. He was sentenced last week to 20 years in prison. The United States Attorney's Office are also working to combat mail-based financial exploitation. In May of 2015, prosecutors in Florida brought charges in a widespread sweepstakes mail fraud scheme. In September, prosecutors in Long Island also brought charges in an alleged mail sweepstakes, sweepstakes fraud scheme. These are but two examples of the type of cases pursued by the department. Investment schemes also continue to be a problem. For example, in January of 2015, two defendants in Florida were sentenced to 10 years in prison for their role in a scheme to defraud elderly investors out of $18 million. The defendants took money from the victims purporting to invest them in CDs, but instead used the money to make payments to earlier investors and pocketing it for themselves to buy themselves things. The court ordered restitution of almost $10 million in that case. The, de the department also provides training to prosecutors on elder abuse and exploitation. For example, since 2013, the department has trained state and local prosecutors through its National Institute on Prosecuting Elder Abuse. 
an intensive four-day training that covers the elements of bringing an elder abuse and exploitation case. The department will enroll prosecutors from all 50 states by 2017. But prosecuting cases is only one component of a comprehensive strategy to combat elder abuse and exploitation. Preventing these crimes from happening at all is similarly a priority. Every year, the department participates in the Rocky Mountain Fraud Summit in Denver. The summit consists of interactive presentations about investment frauds that target our communities, including seniors. The department hosts similar outreach events across the country. Additionally, research is a critical component of a successful strategy to combat elder abuse and exploitation. Over the last 10 years, DOJ awarded over 20 grants, amounting to over $9 million, that examine diverse elder mistreatment issues, including projects on financial exploitation of the elderly. In September of 2014, the department launched its Elder Justice website, which has been accessed more than a half a million times since its launch. The website is a one-stop shop for resources on all aspects of elder abuse and exploitation. The department in fiscal year 15 provided $1.5 million that will support approximately 60 AmeriCorps lawyers and paralegals who will provide legal assistance and support to victims of elder abuse and exploitation. And OVC's funding is also used by states to support services for elder victims of crime. The department continues to work hard to combat the exploitation of our nation's seniors. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the department's efforts, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Martin, I'm truly saddened to learn that your father at age 77 fears that he may spend the rest of his life in a jail overseas, far from his family, when he had no intention of breaking the law. That to me is very troubling, and while there are many attorneys on this panel, it came as a surprise to me that you didn't have to prove intent, criminal intent, in many of these countries in order to be convicted. Is there any hope of his release? Do you, are you pursuing other avenues to see if you might be able to get your father returned to the United States. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Collins. Um, we are uh, discussing with his attorney in Madrid uh, about what can be done. Uh, basically, the, the sentence was mandatory based on the quantity of cocaine that he had. There's no extenuating circumstances matter. He, he admitted to it at the time he was caught. Uh, there was no point in taking it to trial, so he actually uh, pleaded out to get the lowest. It could have been anywhere from six to nine and then he could get uh, potentially two years uh, forgiven for, on good behavior. So, um, but he, they can make a pardon to the king. They can uh, try to get him uh, expelled due to his age and health, and I guess the attorney is gonna you know, try to make some efforts uh, to do that. Mr. Brown, can you give us a sense of the magnitude of this scheme, the numbers, for example, of people, American seniors, who are imprisoned overseas. Are there cases that you're aware of where the couriers made it to the destination without being intercepted? This is a huge problem. Um, 6 October of 2013, um, over 144 individuals that we're aware of um, have been intercepted um, transporting narcotics um, identified through the uh, targeting efforts of Customs and Border Protection and our HSI agents at the National Targeting Center. 83 of those were United States citizens. Um, 30 of those United States citizens remain in prison. Um, but it's, the magnifold is worse than that. Um, magnitude is worse than that. You know, the officers, the Customs and Border Protection officers um, and the HSI agents working on this project um, are some of the best you could ever meet, um, are as shocked and appalled at the heinousness of this crime as everyone else. Um, but the targeting parameters take effort to build. Um, we were not aware of Mr. Martin's case until we received that information via the, the tip line maintained um, by this committee, and I thank you for that. Um, so, you know, of the 144, those are the 144 that we were able to identify. Um, you know, there's certainly a very good pool out there, like unfortunately Mr. Martin, that we weren't able to identify and haven't been able to link to Cocoon. Um, 
as I said, 30 persons, uh, 30 United States citizens, uh, to the best of our ability to track that, um, remain in jail overseas. Um, sometimes that's a very difficult number to track. Um, some countries have uh, very strict disclosure laws on their criminal uh, proceedings. Um, so largely we're just tracking that by return travel to the U.S. If we can't see return travel to the U.S., there's an assumption that they have, uh, they're still in custody. Um, but we could have some that have returned to the U.S. that still have charges pending overseas that have just been allowed to uh, come home while those charges are pending. Thank you. I can see why international criminals would want to use an elderly person. When Mr. Martin described his father being picked up in a wheelchair, that's not your, that's not your image of a drug courier. Ms. Steinberg, I have very little time left, but I have to say that you described a whole host of schemes, but you didn't touch on the one that this hearing is focused on. So what specifically is the Department of Justice doing to combat this heinous new scam? Uh, thank you, Chairman Collins, for that question. Um, we actually became aware of the operation fairly recently in the context of this hearing, actually. Um, and this is a, an HSI operation. Our understanding from speaking to them is that DOJ has been supportive when asked. Um, to support their efforts, for example, in terms of process and search warrants and things like that. Um, we don't believe um, that a case has actually been presented yet for prosecution, um, but as you know, the abuse of vulnerable populations, including the elderly, is a strategic priority of the department, and if and when these cases are prosecuted, we'll look at them presented for prosecution more accurately. We will take them very seriously and look at the facts of the evidence and move on from there. Senator McCaskill. Um, so we, you think we still have 30 victims in prison in other countries? Yes, I would give a very important caveat on that. Um, I can't affirmatively 100% attest that all 30 of those people did not have some knowledge and are 100% true victims. Well, do we have an obligation to find that out? I mean, we have a whole host of victims organizations in the Department of Justice that are funded extensively. Um, are the victims organizations reaching out to these 30 people to try to determine, are we investigating whether or not these 30 people are in fact, can we, because if we can confirm that they're victims, then we have a moral obligation as a country to get them out of there. Um, is the Justice Department intervening with the countries, asking for pardons, asking for um, you know, is the State Department involved? What, what do we need to do to get Mr. Martin's father out of prison, for Christ's sake? This is ridiculous. He's a victim. He's not a criminal. One of the things that we are doing in HSI is where there is exculpatory information, we are making sure uh, that is shared. Um, and with who? With the government that is prosecuting, with our, our law enforcement counterparts through our attache. Is the State Department involved? State Department is involved. The State Department, and I can't speak for them, um, generally does not um, interject themselves into uh, foreign legal process in terms of guilt or innocence. But if we know they're a victim, this is a little different. I know we don't get involved. I mean, I get it, believe me. We cannot get involved when a, an American citizen is accused of a crime in a foreign country, just as we would not want them to get involved in our processes. But if we know they're a victim, and if, I think we have an obligation to figure out if they're victims, I certainly don't think anybody's gonna argue, I don't think you would argue, Ms. Steinberg, that Mr. Martin's father is a victim, correct? Uh, I, at this point, I have no basis to conclude that he is anything but a victim. Obviously, I'm operating on the information that I've been given, but um, I will say that, again, at this point, we haven't been presented in any cases in terms of evaluating them from prosecutions who are operating on fairly limited. Yeah, but we're not asking you to get involved in prosecution. We're asking you to advocate for a victim. Um, they've been prosecuted by another prosecutor, but they're still American citizens. I would really like to see some answer from, uh, it, from your bosses, um, from Secretary Johnson and from uh, Attorney General Lynch about what obligation do we have when we know someone has been victimized? Um, just because they're, uh, they're located in a different country doesn't remove the status of a victim, and it seems to me we need to do more. Um, Ms. Steinberg, um, can you tell me how many prosecutions we've had of criminals 
uh, in the last five years that have been engaged in the various scams that we've talked about today? What is the total number that has been prosecuted by the federal government? I actually can't give you a number. I apologize for that. I don't come here with the number um, of every prosecution that involves these particular scams that involve the elderly. Would you mind compiling that for us? I, I can take that back and see if that's possible. Yeah, I, I know it's possible because you told us there were 100 on Jamaica. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think anecdotally doesn't help us, you know, two in New Jersey and two down in Florida. I think we need to get a sense of how, and, and I would particularly be interested in how many people have been extradited in connection with those crimes, because we all know the reason we need you so badly here is that you're the only one that has the reach. You're the only one that can go there. And I need to know how many times you've gone. Um, so if, if possible, if you would get back to us on the number of cases that have been presented, the number of cases that have been filed, the number of cases that have been extradited, and I'm really interested in the ones that you filed, how many were guilty pleas and how many were trials. Because in my experience, the vast majority of cases that are indicted by the federal government are pleas. So I think it is, in some ways, to say you've done 100 cases of a certain type in, since 2009, that's about 14 a year. You have literally hundreds of U.S. attorney's offices around the country, and the vast majority of those cases, I guarantee you, were a plea. Um, so I want to get a sense of the amount of resources that's really being given uh, to this issue, because... I, we have so many witnesses that come here. This is the first time we've had a chance to talk to somebody from justice. We've had a number of these hearings, and the local law enforcement that are trying to help these people in their local communities, um, especially on the IRS impersonation scam, they say they call the Department of Justice and no one's home. So I want to figure out what the truth is here. Um, do we really have the resources necessary at justice to handle this problem? And if it's not getting handled, um, why not? And what can we do to help you? Um, get it handled. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Flake. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for the testimony. Mr. Brown, uh, just given Mr. Seibert's testimony about how he had been contacted and is still being contacted, I guess, in 400 emails a day um, now because he responded and has uh, put over quite a bit of money, uh, let me just read a little bit of a one of the emails that he received that was ostensibly from my office, um, from an individual who is actually on my staff. Obviously, it wasn't for him, but they have names. And uh, they encouraged him to um, you know, send a check to post office, also um, telling him to stop listening or colluding with, and they name another senator, a US senator, because they bilked him out of $900 before, supposedly. Um, but to keep, keep with us, and, uh, and we'll get you money. So it's a, a very troubling thing when some of these people are getting letters ostensibly for, from our offices to somehow lend legitimacy uh, to some of these scams. How often is that the case? And uh, what other methods are being used to try to lend legitimacy to what they're doing? Um, one of the most tragic things that we see is that once a person is victimized once, uh, once the organization is recognized they can get their hooks into them, uh, it's next to impossible to get yourself off of that hook. Now, there are proactive steps persons can take. They can change their email address. They can change their phone number. Um, but frankly, you know, they maintain lists of, of victims and sell those lists, and the more that it's been scammed out of a victim, the more that victim is worth to the next scammer, um, knowing that they can likely replicate that success. Um, you know, as you heard, we actually intercepted Mr. Seibert um, in, a, in Atlanta after he'd flown from Tucson to Atlanta, um, starting his journey. Um, when he got back to Arizona, our agents in Tucson met with him and were shocked um, to hear that he was actually going to go from their office uh, where he met with them to send money <laughs> to one of these scammers. Um, so again, you know, we cautioned him at that time. Um, again, the challenge is for us is, you know, you know, we can educate. I can't stop. I don't have a legal mechanism to stop a United States citizen from traveling if they choose to. I don't have a, a lawful mechanism to to stop a United States citizen um, from sending money if they choose to. 
Um, one of the things that we've done um, in terms of outreach is we've worked with the banks, um, with the money service businesses. We've provided them what we would call red flag indicators. Um, and a lot of the money service businesses in particular who were frequently um, used in these scams um, take it upon themselves um, because again, they have an authority as a private business that I don't have as a law enforcement officer to block those transactions to try to stop people from losing money. In this individual case, I don't want you to give away any methods or, or whatever in terms of targeting the, the scammers, but what tipped you off in Mr. Seibert's case and, and led you to go to the airport? I'm going to be very careful about how I uh, talk about our targeting, and thank you for recognizing that. Um, again, this project, again, to give U.S. Customs and Border Protection their due credit, started with them. Um, Secretary Johnson has been committed that we will put full department resources uh, to significant problems, and this certainly is a significant problem. Um, so that's where we married our uh, ICE HSI agents up with CBP. Um, they build the targeting off a number of factors, um, travel patterns, methods of purchase of, of airfare, um, and a whole bunch of other things that I, I'd be happy to provide to you in a, a closed setting. But one of the things that's very important is uh, in bringing that investigative piece into, the, into this um, is as we meet um, with the Mr. Seibert, as we, you know, either, you know, as victims or potential victims, give us um, the emails, the receivers, they recount their phone calls, or we work with the Department of Justice and get search warrants. Um, we take, you know, that evidence, which is also has an intelligence value, we work back with CBP to help them further expand that targeting platform so that hopefully, you know, in the future, um, you know, we won't have Mr. Martin getting through <laughs> where the possibility exists we could potentially stop him from traveling. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Kane. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to all of the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Martin, I want to ask you a question. In your testimony, you indicated, I think, that your dad had been in prison for a while before you found out. How, how did that, w w did they, I, I'm just curious about that. Did they not let him reach out? Was he so kind of traumatized by the experience that he wasn't sure what to do? I'm, uh, I found that kind of grabbed me as you were talking. Yes, yeah, Senator. Um, basically, the way it happened was when he got apprehended, um, obviously the State Department was notified, and they notified his wife, who lives in Maine. I'm out in Nevada. I see. I see. So, and he had just recently married her. I didn't even know her. Uh -huh. I mean, I knew of her, but then I didn't yeah. really know her. And so it, it, um, I'm trying to remember if she told us or I think she might have told us mm -hmm. or my sister and then um, the, the, the person at the embassy, the State Department, actually emailed me. And because his wife didn't want anything more to do with it. So she emailed yeah. me and said, I understand that maybe you can be the one to, that I work with. To them, it's been the most stunning call you ever got in your life. Yeah. Your father is in prison in Spain for this. He had been involved in other minor you know, yeah. situations where he'd been ripped off in mm -hmm. the past. So I wasn't totally shocked, but obviously it was still a pretty uh, incredible story. And, and his, his wife was getting at least some kind of threatening calls because of some of this Absolutely. that was making her very <clears throat> nervous. Absolutely, and, and a couple people went to visit my sister while mm -hmm. he was living there. He wasn't home at the time, mm -hmm. looking for him, for various mm -hmm. things, so, yeah. Very <clears throat> troubling. Well, I wanna ask now to Mr. Brown and, and Ms. Steinberg on this question. If I, I would think, I, I was never a prosecutor, but I did uh, try a lot of cases. If you had the person you know, you put this case on before a jury, I mean, the jury's gonna wanna throw the book at these crooks, but the problem is getting the person, and especially the challenges, if any of this, that, that originates overseas. Just talk a little bit about, from the kind of investigation prosecutorial standpoint, the challenges of tracking down some of these folks when they're uh, in other countries, and, and, and the level of cooperation you need from the other countries to be able to do an investigation, get an extradition, get a, a successful prosecution. You're right. There are very significant challenges. Um, we have had tremendous cooperations. We maintain um, 62 international offices in 46 countries. Um, we have robust international partnerships um, across law enforcement. Um, but again, there you know it's not like this organization. You know, you may not just have a, a Spain-based yeah. organization. Uh, it could be Spain. It could be Dubai. It could be Japan. It could be a network that runs across all three. Um, so it's not just U.S. coordinating with one entity, it's mm -hmm. trying to get all those entities coordinating and, and around various differences in their own laws. Um, 
and sometimes the strongest venue for the prosecution is <laughs> in one of those foreign venues. Right, right. Um, mm -hmm. We have had some success. Um, as I mentioned, we've arrested 15 persons truly aligned with with the criminal organizations mm -hmm. um, all overseas. Um, some of that has been through uh, coordinated undercover activity um, between uh, the U.S. government and overseas law enforcement. Um, and when you do those arrests, is the intention always to try to bring somebody back here for prosecution? Or as you point out, in some other countries, the laws may even be better. Do you try to work with local authorities so that criminal uh, cases are initiated in the jurisdictions where you arrest people? Wherever the best case is. Yeah. Um, certainly, if we're generating, you know, a large part of the evidence overseas or a large part of the evidence just exists overseas, oftentimes um, it's best to prosecute the case overseas. Mm -hmm. And can I just kind of hear the Justice Department's uh, uh, perspective on the same issue about going after these crooks who are overseas and how challenging it is and what success you're having? Certainly, the me and the members of the committee are right. I think several members have indicated that when there's an international component, um, to these cases, it just adds just an extra layer of complexity. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've found is that the positive engagement of these um, foreign governments is very important. Um, and we do that, and obviously other agencies do that. And I think the Project Jolt is a reflection of the positive um, sort of results of those kind of partnerships, whether it be a working group it, it, or it be through other means um, that we work with these governments to, through MLATS to be getting evidence or through extradition requests. Um, and, you know, for example, Project Jolt, we've had our first uh, extradition from Jamaica. And once you kind of get over that first hurdle, it gets easier. And so that's just what we do. We just work the cases. Um, and we'll keep doing that. Uh, thank you. I may want to ask a question just for the record about if there are countries with whom you would like to have stronger cooperation. Um, I know colleagues on the Foreign Relations Committee would be interested in that. We have a lot of opportunities to interact with a lot of these countries and bring up issues of significance and if there are countries in this kind of scam area where better cooperation would be helpful to either of your agencies, I think we'd like to know them and maybe we could pursue that. Thank you. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I tell you, the, uh, the only positive thing I heard out of any of the testimony of the witnesses was the 20-year sentence that one of these thugs received. I hope that he or she serves every single day of it. Um, Mr. Martin, can you tell me a little bit about the cost uh, that has been incurred uh, by your family in the process of trying to untangle this mess that your father's involved in, the, 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 per, uh, the, the actual economic cost and what you're going through right now? Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, it's about 5,000 euros is what his lawyer's charging, which is very good price because when, when I received the referrals from uh, State Department, um, most of them went a 10,000 retainer, and we found one that was would do, do it for five spread out over time. So we're just basically paying him what we can each month. Yeah. So. Mr. Brown or uh, Ms. Steinberg, uh, are, are you all familiar? Do you have any insights into the reverse people being scammed in other countries coming to the United States, if there's any evidence of that and how well we're doing in dealing with the victims on this side of the ocean? We have not really seen evidence of that. Um, and part of that is uh, drug values. Um, unfortunately, uh, drugs are not very expensive here as they are in many um, European um, and Asian countries. Um, for example, you know, at the street value of a kilogram of meth in the United States is about $66,000. Um, that same uh, street value figure for a kilogram of meth in Japan is well north of $400,000. Um, so if you're going to go to this effort, um, they're trying to maximize their profit. Ms. Steinberg, are you aware of any, any instances like this or prosecution cases? No, sir. I guess that's a good thing. Uh, I have, I have a, uh, uh, Mr. Brown, um, if you take a look at uh, what law enforcement's trying to do now, say with sexual predators uh, going out there and really baiting them into a condition where the first time they're interacting with somebody, they're interacting with law enforcement. Are there any, is, are there any resources now being applied to those sorts of uh, efforts, uh, either for this scam or any number of scams where you can you can probably identify the kind of profile that they're looking at and uh, have them have the unpleasant situation of it being a, a U.S. law enforcement agency? Yes, there are. Um, 
there's a lot of logistical hurdles to that. Um, you know, not knowing where the scammers exist, kind of until you kind of get into the scam and have some time to, to crack <laughs> um, the internet spoofing that they're doing to figure out where they may actually be, um, and then having to figure out what are the laws in that country that apply, um, makes that challenging. But yes, it's been done. Um, certainly, where we can identify people that are being scammed. We've had people give us access to their emails where we've stepped in um, and assumed uh, the role of the victim um, in an under undercover capacity. Um, but one of the challenges remains, um, it, it's a very underreported mm -hmm. uh, crime. You know, people don't recognize they're getting scammed, hence it's a scam. Yep. Um, so that opportunity isn't always there as often as we would like it to be. They, uh <clears throat> A lot of this, we've we've dealt with several hearings where we're talking about people preying on uh, seniors, and uh, it, it really a lot of this does come back down to education and trying to do our best to make sure, as you said, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. What coordination have we had with other agencies that are, say, more likely to touch the seniors' population to use them as channels for education? I'm thinking. Anytime we interact with anyone who's on Social Security, anyone who's on Medicare, or maybe uh, Veterans Administration for seniors, uh, are there any coordinated efforts there to make sure that they're using those touch points to educate on this and any number of other okay. uh, potential risks that seniors are being exploited for? Absolutely. Um, we try to do outreach through, <laughs> through any and every available avenue. Um, we have not specifically gone to Social Security, but I will actually take that as a good idea to follow up on. Um, but, you know, we do outreach through um, many of the same things that uh, Ms. Steinberg touched on, um, through some of those same interagency working groups, um, through some of those same conferences. Uh, it just but seems we also, like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm we've also done proactively through our, our field offices, gone out and talked in nursing homes to not just the people living there, but their family members, just to do anything we can to raise awareness. Well, you know, I hope that we can just figure out a way to at least let this be an instance where seniors can find some safe haven and call in a number or forwarding an email in and out, send it here and let's see if we can identify patterns. It just seems like there are some natural connections, particularly, as I said, with Social Security, Medicare, where we may be able to, on a very cost-effective basis, have a pretty broad reach out there beyond what you would do in the communities and on a recurring basis, because they continue to get more sophisticated, they continue to be, uh, produce more dreadful outcomes, and everything we can do to increase education is gonna be the single greatest way to improve the situation. Finally, I wanna associate myself with everything uh, Senator McCaskill said in terms of getting information and trying to get behind these 30, I think you said 145 have been affected by it, um, 44 were still in custody of those 44, 30 are U.S. citizens. Anything that we can do, and I think probably speak for all the members, uh, to move heaven and earth to try to get them back if we're absolutely certain uh, that they are innocent, then uh, we certainly want to do that. It's horrible to think that Mr. Martin and others are being held uh, as victims. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Casey. Thanks very much. I want to thank the panel for um, your testimony and for your work on this. And uh, Mr. Martin, we appreciate you bringing a personal story that's um, hard, to, hard to hear because of um, what happened to your father. And I know it's not easy to tell that story, so we appreciate it. But it does have the benefit of giving us a better understanding. It's not just uh, conceptual or theoretical when you hear your story. I was going to direct, I think, maybe two questions to Mr. Brown in the time that I have. I've been uh, in uh, government a while. I've been here in Washington nine years and prior to that ten years in state government. And so if you're around government a lot or somewhat connected to uh, government service of one kind or another, we tend to think in terms of you know, specific parts of budgets and different um, agencies, so it's very easy for us to kind of keep track of where things fit. Uh, most folks out there, because they're not dealing with government on a regular basis, don't know where to turn sometimes to get information. It's probably true of every Senate office that we, back home, we probably get as many calls about some other level of government, and that's just the, the nature of the, the complexity of different levels 
of government, but maybe especially when someone is um, when someone is under siege or they're, they've got they're under attack in a sense because uh, a scammer has put pressure on them and and caused a lot of anxiety and, and pain. That's probably the worst time for them to try to uh, determine where to start. So I guess one thing I'd ask you, and this is based upon constituents that have asked us uh, or presented to us cases uh, where a family member or someone they know has been affected, what's the, the best way for either, I guess, a family member or even a, uh, an aging organization to report incidents like this? And I know you may have addressed this, but just wanted to, <clears throat> by way of reiteration, if you haven't. Uh, thank you for giving me that opportunity because I had not gotten a chance to say that yet. Um, again, the, the committee itself um, maintains a tip line, um, and the committee coordinates very closely, uh, referring cases as appropriate to, uh, to, to ICE. But, but we also maintain our own uh, tip line. Uh, the phone number is 1-866-DHS-2-ICE or 866-347-2423. Um, you can also go to www.ice.gov um, and report tips there. Our tip line is manned 24-7, you know, 365 days of the year. We have agents, we have intelligence analysts, and if it falls outside of our purview, we will get it to the right people that can do something with it. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the number again? Just yes, it's just uh, one more time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, one eight six six three four seven two four two three. Or one eight six six DHS two ICE. Great, we appreciate that because that um, that helps to uh, give give folks a place to go. Um, I guess the other question I had is with, with regard to ICE. Maybe two more, and I'll make the second one quick. Uh, has ICE been able to determine a root cause for the the increase in these kinds of crimes, international crimes? Is there any any predicate to it that would help us better combat it, or? I could speculate. I don't know that I've got a formal okay. finding on that. Um, they're low overhead. Um, if you've got a computer, if you've got a phone, mm -hmm. uh, you can commit these scams. Right. Um, just the abundance of information out there on people um, in the age of the Internet, be it social media, be it just pulling information out of obituaries, um, has made it much easier to sell a believable story. Mm -hmm. The last question I'll ask, and you can amplify it in uh, a written response if you want, is just one of the reasons we have hearings is to have you tell us what you need or what you hope we would do by way of new legislation, new policy, new funding, whatever it is. I hope you uh, either today or, or in written form tell us uh, what you hope this committee could do to, to better uh, equip you to do your job. I will take that back to get you as complete an answer as I possibly can. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cotton. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Martin, I also have reviewed your testimony. I want to associate myself with the remarks of the other senators here, saying that it is both poignant uh, and appalling. I can't believe that uh, U.S. citizens would face this kind of treatment abroad, particularly with countries that are allies. Um, you certainly are blessed with a very capable and effective advocate in Senator Collins. What's been your experience with some of the agencies and department of our federal government, say the State Department, for instance, in this case? Yeah, the, the individual I was dealing with with the State Department was is excellent. I mean, we have an ongoing uh, relationship with her because we wire money to him once a month. He needs money for in prison to, to buy things. Um, I can't say enough about the, the job they have done for him. And, you know, the, the government of Spain themselves, I really don't hold the blame. I mean, they, they've had an influx of, of drugs through their country, and, and they've actually l l lowered the sentencing from what I've been told, from what it used to be. Um, but again, in his case, he didn't go to trial. You know, he couldn't afford trial, so he just pled out and got the, the least sentence that, that was available to him. And then the strategy is just try to work with uh, you know, his, his attorney working with the government to see if they can get him expelled and sent back. He's not a threat to anybody, you know. It's, do you, be, do you believe that the government of Spain is, is aware of all the facts of the case and accepts those facts as true? Honestly, don't know, Senator. I kind of doubt it, you know, that it's that big of a priority to them. He's one of many in their jails from all over the world. Uh, Ms. Steinberg, uh, 
you've been a prosecutor. Um, do you think it is difficult to assemble the facts in a case like this to present that to a foreign government and say, yes, he seems, this gentleman seems to have been caught red-handed, but here are the facts behind our conclusion that he was an innocent victim of a scam of a genuine drug trafficker? I think in this situation, what you'd go about doing is it wouldn't necessarily be a prosecutive um, type of endeavor, but it would be through to so the relationships that we have, for example, the ICE attaches that might be in country um, to communicate with their counterparts the information that we might have that would help influence the process. Um, again, I don't have a lot of information about these particular facts, but that's generally how we would go about exchanging that information, and that's how we make the most progress, as I indicated, um, when we have these sort of international um, cases is sort of forging these positive relationships with our foreign counterparts and encouraging them to cooperate with us. Um, and that goes both ways. And Mr. Brown, what's your perspective on that? Uh, one of the things that we have done in our overall efforts under Operation Cocoon is, you know, not just shared investigative referrals. Uh, we've shared our targeting methodology with these countries, because I want to be very clear, this is not just a U.S. citizen uh, issue. Um, you know, this happens to people all over the world that are getting duped into this same thing. We just happened to stumble upon it first. Um, so a lot of these other countries, because of the level of information that we're sharing with them, have a very good understanding and are coming to a very good understanding um, that this scheme does exist. Um, as I said, where we can get our hands on potentially exculpatory information, we are doing everything we can to get that into the right hands with the foreign government. Okay. I, I just find it astonishing that given what I believe is the relatively straightforward investigative matters that you would assemble the facts necessary to prove Mr. Martin's innocence um, and present it to a such an allied country uh, that this matter wouldn't have been resolved before now. Um, I mean, our military and our intelligence services often stand as a proxy for other countries. Our nuclear umbrella extends deterrence uh, to most countries in the world. We have an $18 trillion economy, the largest consumer economy in the world. We have a lot of leverage uh, that, at least at a minister-to-minister -minister level, we should be willing to exert. Um, and you've heard some of the senators in this hearing uh, give Mr. Brown the opportunity to uh, state the phone number or a website or what have you. Uh, I would like to state for the record that I hope any Arkansans at least, and I would su subject any Americans, uh, feel that they can contact their congressman and their senator about this. Um, in some cases, when Americans have been held unjustly as hostages, people like Congressman Del Kilday from Michigan or Congressman Ted Deutsch from Florida have been dogged advocates for their release. Um, as I know Senator Collins is a tireless advocate here, I certainly would do the same thing, and I venture that any member of this panel or the Senate would as well, to assemb help assemble the facts necessary and to assure it receives attention at the highest levels of the State Department. So uh, unjustly detained, often victimized senior citizens can be released promptly and, and returned home, given all the massive leverage that the United States government has with uh, other governments around the world. So. Uh, Mr. Martin, I'm very sorry about this, um, but I hope that all Americans uh, who have family members that fall victim to this scam know that they can contact their senator or their congressman uh, to help expedite matters as well. Thank you very much. Uh, your point is so well taken, and it's we're going to work closely with ICE. We have a list of the countries where this appears to have occurred that I'm going to be following up with Mr. Brown on. And if I could just uh, say as well, for the record, to reference something Senator Tilla said, I would hope the reverse would be true as well. Uh, if a foreign citizen right. uh, was in this case on American soil, uh, that our allies, uh, foreign ministers or prime ministers, would feel they can contact the, the ministers at the highest level of our government and have this resolved expeditiously, because we certainly wouldn't want to have in detention foreign citizens here who are innocent uh, and innocent victims of a scam and that we would want to move matters along as promptly as possible outside the ordinary course of the criminal justice system, since this is as much a matter of diplomatic relations between friends and partners as it is traditional criminal justice. Exactly. Thank you. Senator Gillibrand. 
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Madam Ranking Member. I'm very grateful that you're holding this hearing. Obviously, these stories are very alarming and uh, extremely upsetting. So I'd like to ask Mr. Brown, um, how do these scammers make the initial contact with potential victims? And what red flags can our seniors look out for? And what are some of the factors that make older adults more vulnerable for these schemes? And how are we trying to prevent this crime? Uh, I'll kind of start at the reverse order. Um, older uh, Americans tend to be uh, more susceptible, um, oftentimes because they don't have the internet savvy. Um, may not have, there may be a level of cognitive or memory impairment. Um, oftentimes, um, there's a challenge of just being lonely, and it's, it's an outlet, it's somebody to talk to. Um, it's a friend when maybe you're not that mobile and you can't get out and, and associate with friends. Um, I forgot the other parts of your question. What, yeah. can, we what can we do to prevent this? Uh, again, I think, again, vigorous prosecutions where we can, be it they in the U.S. or overseas, um, but education and making sure that where you think there's a scam, that law enforcement is getting that information so that we can build those successful cases that we can take to the prosecutors, get successful prosecutions that we can use to identify additional people before they potentially um, travel um, and get themselves uh, in hot water. Mm -hmm. Ms. Steinberg? I agree that the, the early intervention and prevention efforts are essential. Um, and that's a cornerstone of our elder justice initiative. And we, across the country, are doing um, outreach events through our youth attorneys community, through our victim witness coordinators, and also through main justice as well to talk about these different schemes um, and you know, targeting it toward the, the communities that are most vulnerable, including our seniors. And speaking to the, the first part of your question about what um, makes individuals more vulnerable or at risk. Um, there is actually research in the field about it, and you know some of that is actually funded by the department. And it talks about issues of cognitive impairment, um, isolation, and then ultimately embarrassment. That drives uh, the desire to keep it secret and not disclose it, which then causes sort of this domino effect of additional victimization. So how do you do that outreach? I've done um, roundtables and various educational events for seniors around my state. How does the DOJ actually interface with seniors? How do you meet with them? Where do you have these meetings? How often do they take place? How many have you had in New York? Uh, well, I can give you a few examples um, from around the country. Um, one of the examples is the Rocky Mountain Fraud Summit, which happens in Denver. Um, it's something that's driven by the U.S. Attorney's Office there. They go into community, particularly senior living facilities, um, and they do interactive presentations and run scenarios. Um, that's also something that was done um, in Minnesota as well, also driven out of the U.S. Attorney's Office. We also have an example in Tulsa um, where they did outreach regarding an IRS impersonation scam. The U.S. Attorney released a press release um, and did some engagement on that particular scam to educate people. So that sort of field-based outreach that happens day to day just, you know, it, with, within the U.S. Attorney's community, victim witness coordinators and, a, and AUSAs. We also obviously programming at Maine Justice as well. A lot of that is run through our Elder Justice Initiative. We have a website um, that's been accessed over half a million times, and they're actually really incredible resources there. You can actually look, look at it by theme, um, the type of victimization, the type of scheme, and you also can get granularly into individual states, not just law enforcement, but also adult protective services and the other services that might be available that are not just law enforcement services. So we take both approaches, both on the in the field level and through Maine Justice. Mm. Well, I would certainly welcome that activity in my state if you have the opportunity to advocate for that, um, but it's needed, and we've had a lot of just so many financial and fraud scams in our state um, because we have a lot of retirees and uh, they have a lot of resources and they're huge targets. Um, Mr. Martin, have you been able to su successfully engage the State Department? Uh, to do what? To help your dad? Uh, they basically are saying that uh, there's nothing they can do at this point. You know, he's in their criminal justice system, he's been sentenced, and I don't think they're doing anything. I think that's outrageous, and I know many people on this panel will feel the same way. Um, we will look forward to engaging the State Department on your behalf. Thank you, sir. Thank you for testifying. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for having this hearing. Uh, as a former U.S. Attorney and also a State Attorney General, I join my colleagues in the outrage they've expressed in being appalled and astonished uh, by evidently a fairly common scam that involves victims from this country, seniors, being lured into drug transport schemes through various means that result in their being imprisoned abroad. So there are really two aspects to the relief that we want to provide. Number one, catch the scammers. Number two, seek the release of innocent victims who are not only financially potentially victims, but also in terms of their personal imprisonment. And uh, I join Senator Cotton in feeling that there ought to be rem remedies at the government-to-government -government level that would seek release of people who, under our own laws, would be acquitted because of lack of criminal intent. They may have been in possession of certain banned illicit substances, but under our own laws, they would be clearly acquitted because there's no strict liability in this country under our criminal laws. So um, if you can tell us, uh, what are the countries where our citizens are in prison? If you have answered that question already, I apologize for asking you again, but uh, maybe you can tell us. I don't have that list with me. Um, Spain, obviously where Mr. Martin is, um, New Zealand, although they've been very I read that. Mr. Solis, I think, yeah. is in. Uh, he's, Mr. Solis is now out. He's out, but he was in he New was, Zealand. Yes. Um, are there other Americans in New Zealand now in prison? Not to the best of my knowledge, but I'd have to follow back on that. Um, as I explained earlier, one of our challenges is um, with privacy laws in some of these countries, we don't necessarily know where that person stands in the prosecution phase. Um, so oftentimes we're tracking where the person's still in custody simply by have they, can we you see mean if they in those In those countries, trials are not open. In some of those countries, that is correct. Well, here's, I know you're, I don't want to put you on the spot today in this hearing, but I think one of the basic questions is what countries, how many U.S. citizens, and whether we can do anything about it, right? Yes. Because the solution is not a habeas corpus petition in those countries filed by their attorneys. For them, uh, habeas corpus is a non-remedy, presumably, uh, so we might as well be filing a ham sandwich in those countries. Uh, and at the government-to-government -government level, we need to know what the governments are, what the countries are, so that, as Senator Cotton has suggested, whether it's ministerial or presidential or whatever level, we need to free those Americans. So I, I'm making a request that you provide this committee on whatever basis you can, confidentially or otherwise, a list of those countries. Uh, we will work on that. Um, State Department also could probably provide you some pretty good answers on that because they have some more visibility on that if, once it gets to that phase. And uh, let me then uh, pursue what I think has been another line of questioning here in terms of the scammers themselves. Uh, how many cases have been made against them? Um, we have, um, specific to Cocoon, um, there have been 15 persons um, tied to the uh, transnational criminal organizations um, arrested and prosecuted, all of which were done overseas but in concert uh, with my agency. Um, and there are numerous ongoing investigations, which I'm not at liberty to talk about. There are, there are ongoing investigations, 15, 15 individual defendants charged? Correct. 
and have they what what what's the status of those prosecutions? Uh, some of those are still going through the legal process in the countries where they've been charged. They haven't been charged in this country. No, they have not. Why not? Uh, again, it's uh, simply an issue of where the best evidence. Uh, Why haven't they been extradited? Why haven't they been charged in this country? Their, their victims are American citizens. Why are we, and I apologize for maybe stating this in non-legal terms, why are we counting on their justice, justice system that is already imprisoning our citizens unjustly to exact justice for making those citizens victims? Why don't we extradite them? Why don't we charge them here? Why don't we prosecute them here? What's the point of investigating them if we're not going to prosecute them here? Um, in certain instances, um, there probably would not be sufficient venue in the U.S. Um, if a person flies, and again, I'm not an attorney. I'm, <laughs> I'm a law enforcement officer, um, and there is a difference. Okay, um, again, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, and I don't want you to speculate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Ms. Steinberg, you may have you are a lawyer so you may have another answer so uh chime in if you if you wish but also i would like that information uh simply as to where the trials are taking place and um some explanation for why it's not here We will, get that we will get you that information. Thank you. My time has uh, long since expired, so thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. I just have a couple more questions that I want to quickly touch on. Mr. Brown, from what I understand, some seniors look inside the package or the suitcase that they're given, and they would look at them and not be able to tell that they were carrying drugs. Is that accurate, and can you show us the photos you've brought with you? Absolutely. Um, all the pictures that you will see are from cocoon victims. Um, so in this instance, um, this is a person that was given a bag of candy to take along as a gift um, from stop B to stop C on their trip. Um, when you open the wrappers, and there's a picture that shows that, uh, methamphetamine, not candy. Um, so unless the person, you know, went to that level of scrutinizing what they had, um, they wouldn't know. This is um, one of the common tactics, and it's been a common tactic for smuggling in the commercial air environment for forever, um, is a false walled suitcase. Um, this is where you know, about the thickness of a, a sheet of cardboard. Um, the drugs are put into the lining of the suitcase. Again, there's a weight difference. Um, I believe this suitcase uh, contained uh, seven kilograms of cocaine, so about an extra 15 pounds in that suitcase. Um, but, you know, just looking at the suitcase absent that x ray, you're not going to see it. And this is how they probe it um, in the airport environment. Um, when that drill bit comes out with a white powdery substance, then they'll proceed further into destroying the suitcase. But until they have that probe, they're not even sure. You know, they've got an x-ray that's suspicious. Um, then they'll take it to this step um, to confirm that the drugs are inside. So that's a really good example because in this case, from what I can see, the drugs are hidden in the lining of the suitcase. Is that accurate? Absolutely. If you, you know, weren't familiar with the weight of the empty suitcase, uh, you know, or, you know, what the wall feeling of that suitcase is, uh, it's not visible to the naked eye in any way, shape, or form. I think that's a really important point because even if the senior is curious about what it is, they would open the suitcase and still think nothing was amiss. Is that accurate? Uh, that is accurate. Really, the only indicator would be potentially the extra weight. weight. That's one of the reasons why seniors potentially could be more uh, uh, vulnerable is, you know, luggage has gotten lighter over the years. If you haven't traveled a lot or you've traveled with your old suitcase, you know, that extra 15 pounds or whatever the extra weight may be may not be noticeable to you. And finally, 
I'd like you to give us uh, the a little more detail on the example of the 97-year-old gentleman that I believe you were able to intercept. If you could tell us a little bit about that case, not how you identified him, but where was he headed for, where did you head him off, and also if you have a case where one of your agents tried to intervene and the senior was so caught up in a romance scam and believed the people had been warned to not believe law enforcement. If you could give us those two examples. Um, with the 97-year-old, uh, he was traveling with his uh, adult daughter. I believe she was in her 60s. Um, I don't remember the exact routing of his trip. What I do remember um, is I believe he was supposed to fly out of Atlanta at the last minute. Uh, they rerouted his flight to Detroit. Um, so while we had agents <laughs> standing by to intercept him at the airport, um, we very quickly had to get a hold of another office and get agents scrambling to get to uh, his new route of travel. Um, his case was a little more complicated. Um, he was being targeted by what's called a black money scheme. And I don't know if the committee is familiar with that. I'm not. Um, one of the prevalent uh, frauds um, is what's called a black money scheme. Um, and in a nutshell, it's uh, the person claims that, hey, I've got a bunch of generally U.S. dollars. Um, they've got tainted. They're all dyed black. But I've discovered a secret powder that will get the black off, and then we will have these millions of dollars. Um, so in the instance of the 97-year-old, um, he thought he was going to pick up this magical powder, um, take it to the third country, um, where the money would be cleaned, and he would get a chunk of the money for delivering this, this magical powder. One of the documents he had in his possession when our agents talked to him um, was a letter from this case, it was a West African organization that was scamming him, um, saying, you know, hey, you know, if you stop, it was addressed to whatever customs officials this man was going to meet along the way. Um, and just to make him feel better, wouldn't have meant anything to the customs officials. He meant saying, hey, this powder is our responsibility, it's not his responsibility. Um, you know, that wouldn't have gotten him out of jail. <laughs> exactly. Um, but in that case, he did admit, um, which is one of the challenges, that he suspected he might have been doing something wrong, but the potential of the financial reward was enough to make him think it might be worth doing. Um, we had another instance, to go to the second part of your question, um, where we had a gentleman in Alabama um, that the targeting efforts picked up. Um, we had enough lead time to be able to send agents out to his residence to talk to him. Uh, while our agents were there standing on his front porch talking to him, um, the scammers called. Um, his wife answered the phone, uh, kind of told him, hey, we've got agents here, you know, talking to us right now. He said, well, that's not real law enforcement. We're working with real law enforcement. Um, our agents got squirted off the property at uh, the end of a barrel of a shotgun. Um, but again, that comes down to the challenge of I can't stop a U.S. citizen from traveling if they choose to. Um, the nice happy ending of that story is that gentleman ultimately did <laughs> come to his senses and decide maybe the people standing on his porch were the ones telling him the truth. I was going to travel. ask you whether ultimately he traveled or, or not and what happened, so I'm glad that it had a, a happy ending. And again, I commend you for bringing this scam uh, to our attention. Mr. Martin, uh, as you heard today, there is a lot of sympathy among the members of this, this panel and also feeling that what happened to your father appears to be so unfair and we will follow up. Um, Mr. Brown, if you could help us, I know we've had conversations with you identifying countries in which you believe victimized elderly and senior, uh, senior Americans are being held. Um, and if we could work further with you to try to take a look at that list and see if there's a way that diplomatically we could intervene uh, to get these people returned home whose 
only crime really was being extraordinarily gullible. So I thank you very much, Senator McCaskill. I just have a, a couple of things. Um, we're going to release the annual report on our what comes in across our fraud hotline, and it's tiny compared to what's out there because very few people really know that there's a fraud hotline that exists at the United States Senate. And I'm not sure at this point in time in our country's history very many people trust that we are as serious about this as we are. By the way, the chairman and I have been discussing between us during this hearing how proud we are of you, Mr. Brown, and your colleagues. Um, it's, it, it, we spend a lot of time, it seems, it's very fashionable these days to beat up government every chance we get in every way we can. And it, this is a great example. You came to the committee with this issue and we are honored that you did. You all have, are obviously trying to intercept people at airports to keep them from going down this path, um, which I, is really admirable. You have a lot on your plate. So while I'm stern and want you to do more, I do respect deeply that you all have big jobs and lots of responsibilities. When we released this um, fraud report, it will basically surf over the highlights of what's really going on in terms of seniors being victimized in this country through scams, a lot of which have an international component. Um, if you would organize your response to the committee so that we can look at it based on the scams that we've had hearings about that we know are so prevalent, particularly the IRS impersonation, um, the Jamaican lottery sweepstakes, um, certainly the government grant scams, um, and to the extent that we could look at this drug mule, because obviously this is so international, it's steeped in, in it with an international component, then I think we would better understand the resources that are being spent right now at Justice and what we need to do to, to augment those if necessary. And in that regard, it would really be helpful, Ms. Steinberg, if we would know whose portfolio this really is. I think your job probably is much bigger than this job. I think you got the short straw. Um, we respect the fact that you're here. We've had difficulty with the previous attorney general getting witnesses to appear in front of our committee. So we are, um, I don't want to be so mean to you that you never come back because we are glad you're here. <laughs> but it would be helpful because I understand this weird tension between the mothership and the USAs. Um, my, you know, you don't need to say anything because that would be inappropriate of you. But I completely get it. The mothership has certain things it does in terms of sending signals to all the USAs around the country as to what their priorities should be. Sometimes there is a askance look at what are you doing, this isn't really our priority, and sometimes there is, there, that's, that's it, that's what we want you to really be looking at. And in order for me to get a handle on whether or not it's true, what the local law enforcement is telling us, that we can't get, they can't get you guys interested in this, I need to know who's responsible for this portfolio at the mothership. Who is it that is most directly responsible for sending a signal out that this is a worthy use of, 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 of the Justice Department's resources? Um, if, if you could help me with that, then we can be more specific in our follow-up questions to make sure that we're addressing that to the right person, and that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, as as you've accurately pointed out, um, we have our prosecution. Our system of prosecution is somewhat decentralized. Um, each U.S. Attorney's Office, you know, are, they're making individual decisions about individual cases as they as they come in based on facts and evidence. And at Maine, you know, we signal out to the field about you know what our priorities are, and we have things that are going on also in Maine Justice. Um, we have cases that are driven out of Maine Justice. We have the Elder Justice Initiative, which is out of the civil section. Um, our co consumer protection branch has concurrent civil and criminal jurisdiction so they can drive both of those types of cases. We also have cases that are driven out of our criminal division, um, the Medicare fraud cases. So we do have responsibility dispersed throughout the department on criminal matters, which is what I perceive your, your primary yeah. interest and, and is. and this probably is one of the issues here because you could, is this consumer? Um, you know, is it, you know, is this, and, and I, I guess what I'm really trying to get at is who's going to either show lots of love because these cases are being filed at USA's offices, or who's going to go, what are you doing? How many times have we told you you're supposed to be doing you know, child porn stings, or you're supposed to be doing gun stuff, or you're supposed to be doing 
more, um, you know, stuff on the terrorism. I mean, I, that's what I want to try to get a handle on is mm -hmm. whose who's, who's portfolio it is. Um, and f finally, and most importantly, I think the one thing that you should leave this hearing with is that we will be calling on um, the heads of your agencies and the State Department. Um, we ought to be able, I know how good law enforcement is in this country, Mr. Brown. I mean, law enforcement is amazing. The reason we don't have these cases in our country is because these criminals know it's, they'll get caught here and they'll be put in prison here. So they're hanging out in other countries because they think they can get away with it. So I am fully aware how good law enforcement is. I know that we can figure out if all of these 30 people, these elderly people in prisons around the country are victims. And once we figure out their victims through our use of our law enforcement resources, then we've got to use all the resources we have to get them home. Uh, um, I think this is really a, a stain and I think we, we all need to put a lot more attention to it. And um, I know that Senator Collins feels strongly about it, Mr. Martin, but I, I really want to get your dad home. And we're going to do everything we can thank to you, get Senator. him home. I really appreciate that. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator McCaskill. Committee members have until Friday, February 26th to submit any questions for the record. I want to again thank all of our witnesses today, my ranking member, Senator McCaskill, who always brings her keen legal skills to every hearing that we have, and all of the committee members who participated in today's hearing. We had extraordinary participation today, which shows you how important the committee members view this issue, and I also want to thank the committee staff for its preparation. This hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>